All right, should we start? Uh, maybe let me start by, by making a few remarks to buy us a minute for some people that still want to sure. log in there. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mola Timonyani. I'm the guy who's been emailing you about this, this webinar. Uh, and thank you again for uh, making time in your day to, to join this, this first webinar. Uh, of what we're hoping will be a series of, of metabol met metabolomics webinars throughout the year. Uh, we had a few calendar events um, planned for the year, including the one that was in uh, earlier this year, March. Uh, it's unfortunate that we were forced into this situation because of what's going on inside. So this was our way of trying to keep the momentum with metabolomics and MSA going uh, with events such as this one. And um, I would like to thank Dr. Mason for agreeing to, to be the first person to, to go through this process uh, and talk to us about uh, NMR metabolite profiling. Um, I have to say a few things about who the ACGT is and why we're in this meeting today. Uh, we, we represent the interest of three universities in Houting and two research councils. That's uh, University of Johannesburg, uh, VET University, University of Pretoria, uh, the ARC and the CSR. Uh, what we try and accomplish is to create uh, collaborative programs and partnerships, not only within those five institutions that I've mentioned, but also across uh, any uh, group of re people or researchers that we feel could be beneficial to the partnership and to uh, biotechnology in South Africa as a whole. Hence this sort of initiative, which is um, a birth child of one of our collaborative efforts with um, Metabolomics South Africa, which is uh, a society that's solely dedicated to people involved in metabolomics and metabolomics uh, research. Uh, I would urge you to sign up for membership if you go to their website. Uh, we're sitting at a strong membership number of about 170 people there, and we try and encourage uh, communication and collaboration in, in, in that space. So I urge you to, to register for that. Uh, having said all of that, if you would like um, to work with the ACGT or you need ACGT's help in any way, uh, please feel free to email me after this or whenever you get a chance and we can discuss this further. Uh, we're always looking for, for new partnerships and new ideas to pursue. Um, and specifically to those who would like to share in a group like this, in a platform like this, especially you young scientists, please feel free and we can try and organize something similar and you can maybe present your work or what you feel needs to be heard by people in, 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 in the life science space in South Africa. Um, a few rules to today's webinar. Let's try and keep it flowing if we can. If you have a burning question, please type it in the chat and we can tr try and address it maybe halfway through the talk or towards the end. And then at the end, we can just, if you feel you have a question to ask, you can unmute yourself and you can have a discussion there. Um, so I will quickly introduce Dr. Uh, Mason so he can get started on his talk. Uh, Dr. Shane Mason is from uh, Northwest University uh, in the Laboratory for Infectious Diseases in Human Metabolomics. Uh, he is a specialist in TB meningitis and biofluid analysis and has strong uh, passion for NMR. And he is going to give you guys uh, a few pointers and a few data analysis discussions with regard to uh, NMR metabolite profiling. Um, he has two BSCs, one in biochemistry and bi microbiology and the other statistics and applied mathematics, which I thought was cool. Uh, he completed his PhD um, in a joint effort between Northwest University and VU University in, the, um, in Amsterdam, uh, also on uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, metabolomics. Uh, please, I would like to hand over to him now to give you the talk for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malati. That's a very kind introduction. And welcome to everyone for the first of hopefully many webinars. Um, 
I'm Dr. Shane Mason. I'm going to be doing a step-by-step -step guide on 1-HNMI metabolite profiling. So in this first slide, on the right-hand side there, you can see a wonderfully complex spectrum. It's a urine spectrum, and there are peaks assigned to it. All the peaks there you can see there are names attached to the peaks. And what I'm going to try and do through this webinar is basically, oh, hello. There we go. I'm basically going to try and explain how do we assign metabolite annotations to 1H NMR spectral peaks. So that's going to be my promise to you. So we're still figuring out how to use these Zoom webinar things. <laughs> Okay, so my promise to you is trying to expand your understanding of how this is done. So I'm going to start off with this publication. And why is that there? Okay, lots of bumps along the way, but we'll, we'll make it. No, we'll get there. <laughs> so this is a fairly recent publication, 2016. Um, it's a guide to the identification of metabolites in NMR. Um, done by Imperial College group, a lot of experts there. So what I'm gonna discuss is trying to simplify it as much as possible, but it's a far more complex topic. Uh, this is approximately a 20 page long um, publication. And they go into depth on how to identify. And I'm gonna just blow up this abstract here. And I'm just gonna allow everyone just a minute just to read through this. So you'll see the highlighted part there. What we are tackling here is the bottleneck, the obstacle that has been identified in metabolomics, which is the identification of metabolites. So in the audience, there could be some people who know NMR, some know MS, some know both, some know neither. So I'm gonna try and keep everything on an equal footing here. And we'll cover some of the basics so that everyone can follow from beginning to end. So I'm gonna start with the metabolomics pipeline. And this is something familiar to all the metabolomics experts around here, but for those who are new, it's a great way to understand how, what goes on. So first you need to ask the right biological question in order to choose the right biological samples. It could be anything, it could be mammalian samples, animal samples, plant samples, environmental, it could be anything. Once you have a biological question, biological samples, you need to be able to use the right platform, analytical platform, to analyze these samples. And so this is where your analytical chemist comes into play. Someone who is an expert in this region of NMR, LCMS, or GCMS, you need to choose the right platform for the question. Otherwise, you cannot answer the question. This platform will then produce raw spectral data or MS data, and then you have to process it so basically prepare it for future analysis, for stats analysis, for identification purposes. So there's various different softwares that you do various different things and you create a data matrix that we work with. Now metabolomics is two paths that we generally follow. There's an untargeted path, and in which case you don't really know what you're looking for. You're just comparing group A versus group B and you're gonna do some stats and hopefully find some differentiation. It's, in this, in this illustration, it, it is a linear process, um, targeted as well. It's shown as a linear process, targeted is something you know what you're looking for. So a good example would be diabetes study. A diabetes study, you're gonna look at glucose, ketone bodies. You won't worry about everything else in the spectrum, in the, the data matrix. You're just gonna go and identify those compounds, those metabolites, quantify them and do an interpretation of that. So. This illustration, like many illustrations in literature, is linear, but quite often it's not, not linear. So I'm gonna add some scribbles here and show that the stats part can be quite iterative at times. So you constantly repeat it from beginning to end. You refine your, your, your set of groups you're looking at. You refine your stats based upon your question. But all of this is done in consultation with the stats experts. So, Stats expert must be there at all times, and even from the beginning, from designing the experiment, designing 
how many samples you need, what type of samples you need. So there must be constant communication there. And ultimately what you want to get are candidate biomarkers, classification models. And you can see yeah, it's not so linear anymore. We're now moving downwards towards metabolite identification. So you must remember that with the STAT stuff, we are working with raw spectral data, raw chromatogram, chromatogram data or mass spec data. It is not metabolite data just yet. The STAT expert was, works with the raw stuff and they try and refine it as much as possible give it to us, the, the, the analysts, to try and identify the metabolites. That's what we try and do. And that's what this talk is going to be about, is how to identify the metabolites in order to do your biological interpretation. So I mentioned quite a few experts are needed in this. Uh, analysts, uh, analytical chemists, or stats person. And basically, it's a lot of collaborators, all different expertise, but they must all be involved in the development of the project. So metabolomics is a multidisciplinary field. And this image I've taken from Marie van Rienen's PhD thesis. She is our resident stat expert. And I think it's quite a nice simple image, but also a complex image to explain what is metabolomics. Metabolomics is a combination of various fields. It's biology, chemistry, statistics, biochemistry, biostatistics, chemometrics. And What's important to take from this image is that there is no one single person, there is no one single method, there is no one single platform that can do everything. You need to have multiple people, multiple expertise and communication all the time. And they help refine the, the question, refine the experimental design, refine the information. All of this is needed for a good met metabolomic study. So this is something that you know should have at the front of your mind. It's a multidisciplinary field. I'm going to re-highlight that later on. You need to go back to your stats expert, your analysts, as you go through the projects. So back to the pipeline, the metabolomics pipeline. So Malati mentioned, we just recently formed the Metabolomics South Africa um, group two years ago, I believe it was. Last year, we did a first workshop. And in the NMR workshop component, we did some practical experience. We got example, um, people got to do some sample preparation, load it onto the machine, get some hands-on experience just to see what the machine looks like, what the process is like. And it was a fairly simple sample preparation method. We just took a volume of sample, approximately 90% volume of sample. We added 10% buffer solution. That 10% buffer solution contains potassium phosphate to maintain the pH at approximately 7.4 because pH... It, NMR is a pH sensitive method, so pH is important, and also contains an eternal standard, which we use for quantification and normalization, which I'll discuss a little bit more later. So we created spectra, and there were some good results, and I showed everyone the results, and one of the questions that arose was a very good question, is how do you interpret the spectra? How do you identify what are the metabolites? And my answer was, that's a good question, but let's leave that for another topic. And this is the other topic that we're going to cover now on how to do that. So specifically, I'm going to cover spectral processing. And more in depth is the metabolite identification. So in order to go three steps forward, I'm going to take one step back. So I want everyone on equal footing on how to identify metabolites, but you need a basic understanding of what is occurring in a 1H NMR spectrum. So I've taken three examples here of alcohols, methanol, ethanol, and isopropanol. And as you can see, they're increasing in chemical complexity going up the screen. And one thing you must understand is 1H, 1H NMR is basically we're analyzing the H's, specifically the H's attached to carbons. And there are several other OHs, NHs, and things like that, but the software that we use suppress them or just de detract them from the software, from the, the spectrum. So we don't see the OHs. We don't see the NHs. We just see the hydrogens attached to carbons in a 1H NMR spectrum. So for our most simplest example here, we have methanol. Methanol has a CH3 group, and that produces this one single peak or a singlet, which is represented by three Hs there. H1A, H1B, H1C. So a nice simple pattern for a simple compound. So moving one step up, it's ethanol. 
you see it's a CH3, a CH2, and an OH. We don't see the OH, we're going to see the CH3 and the CH2. CH3 occurs on the right hand side there and it, it presents as three peaks called a triplet represented by the three hydrogens there. So that's quite interesting. Three peaks. Now on the left hand side you're going to have a CH2. It's going to be re represented by four peaks. We call it a quartet. That's two hydrogens. So this is the, the, the spectral pattern for um, ethanol. It's slightly more complex than methanol which is just a single peak. And then going up to isopropanol, it's more complex in its structure and it contains two CH3 groups. And on the right hand side there, those two CH3 groups produce just two peaks, a duplet, which is slightly simpler than ethanol. But in the middle of isopropanol, there's a CH there. And that CH on the left forms seven peaks, a heptet, which is quite complex actually. So you can see you can't really say there's one rule for everything. But I just want to show you from this slide that there are different patterns, simple, complex, and you can think of urine sample from the beginning that I showed, there are hundreds of different chemical compounds all on top of each other. And all we're seeing are the protons attached to carbons in these spectras. So that's how we're going to work forward. Just keep that in, in the front of your mind, that 1H NMR spectra is just hydrogens, protons. And ultimately what I want you to gain from this is that each chemical compound has a unique 1H NMR spectral pattern. So ideally you can think of it as a fingerprint. So that's the background information I've covered now. Now I want to go towards the actual step-by-step -step guide on how do we identify metabolites. So I have yeah, a raw spectral output. And the example that um, we used in the, in the abstract an example I'm going to use going forward is from my master's student's um, study on a typical metabolomic study, an untargeted NMR metabolomic study, where he compared uh, control groups versus meningitis groups and included quality controls within that. And it was approximately 300 samples across six batches. And why do we include quality control samples? Those are very important. So we had a quality control sample after every like 10 sample, we analyzed the quality control sample. And the point of that is to basically analyze the stability of, of the NMR machine, of the, of the method, because we want to minimize the random error and we want to focus upon the biological variation. So this spectrum that you see here, these are the 24 quality control samples that have been analyzed. And you can see it's fairly complex and a lot going on. There's a lot of metabolites, a lot of peaks, now the question is, how do we go about simplifying it? How do we give it to the stats person to analyze? So the stats person won't be able to analyze it as is, as the raw spectral output. We need to put it into a data matrix in an Excel sheet. So as an NMR, NMR analyst, we need to be able to process the spectra to create a data matrix for the stats expert. So the, the simplest way of doing this is the process called binning or bucketing. Now what this means is basically dividing the spectra into set interval widths. So you can imagine a, a spectrum from zero to 10. And if we choose an interval of 0 0.01 and we apply that across the entire spectrum, you'll create a thousand bins. And you can imagine just putting a spectrum through a paper shredder and creating a thousand shreds and doing this for all the spectra. And Ultimately, that's what you're going to give to the data, the, the, to the stats expert is all of these bins. But before you give it to her or him, her, I'm referring to Marie in this case, <laughs> before you give it to the stats expert, you need to normalize it. So normalization um, is important because you have to account for systematic errors such as uh, um, dilution effects. So normalization in NMR is e either through the um, relative to the internal standard or relative to this total spectrum intensity. So that's part of the spectral processing method. And you would then create this. This is an, this is an example of a spectral data matrix. I'm simplifying it as much as possible. So for our experiments that we did, a master student, we identified 271 bins. So you can see the columns there going from bin one, bin two, all the way to bin 271. 
And on the rows from case one to case 300 of different groups, you've got your quality controls, your, your control samples, and the bottom there is an example of a meningitis, is TB meningitis. So you can imagine this matrix is quite large. It's 271 columns wide and 300, 300 rows long. And it's gonna just be lots and lots of numbers. So I didn't wanna put a giant matrix table there of lots and lots of numbers because it is meaningless to us. Um, but it's important to the stats person, but for us, we're just gonna say this is spectral integral data, and that's important for the stats person. So we go back to the spectral processing part. With MS, there's a lot of um, cleaning you have to do with the data, a lot of noise filtering, uh, alignments, um, less so with NMR. We, we do normalization, we can do deconvolution, baseline correction, but you wanna prepare this, the matrix as best as possible in order to give it to the stats expert. And then basically you're gonna ask the stats expert, please take this data matrix and find me biomarkers. I need biomarkers for a publication. And that stats person then the works on magic. And in this case, Marie did some magic and she was able to separate the TB meningitis group versus the control group in this case, this example that, that we're using throughout this webinar. And you can see the blue dots, the controls, they cluster nicely together. And the TBM cases, they are quite more diverse than the control groups, but they differentiate from the control groups. That's important. So in this 3D plot, you can see that the TBM group is different from the control group. And in metabolomics, we value different. Different is good for us. So that is the first step that you do in statistics. And the following steps that you do are customizable depending on how you approach the method. So I have here a table of all the quantitative stats data that we did for this project. And we used univariate measures and multivariate measures. We have cutoff values. We compared 33 controls to 23 TBM cases. And we got this full table of wonderful numbers, more and more numbers. But I'm just gonna minimize this and just say that's quantitative stats data. It's important, but for this webinar, let's just put that aside. And we're gonna concentrate on the bins. How do we get to these bins? So if you recall, we started with 271 bins. The quantitative stats data, we're able to reduce it down to 51 bins. These are 51 statistically important bins. And these are the bins over here. And you can see that just the, the identities are just numbers really. The numbers are, these numbers are positions in the spectra. So going forward, we take the list of 51 bins, and now we want to annotate them. How do we annotate them? So we take this 51 bins, and if you recall a couple of slides back, I talked about the alcohols and that you can have one bin for one metabolite or multiple bins for one metabolite. So this is not necessarily 51 metabolites here, if you go through it, you'll, you'll find that there are 35 annotations. And you see on the right, there are some question marks. So there's some artifacts, I'm not sure what they are. So they're not actually peaks. And then some of them are actually called unknown, labeled as unknown. So there are peaks, but just, we cannot find them in a database. So these are annotations, so not metabolite identities just yet. So we wanna to get towards metabolite identities. How do we get there? So the main question is, how do we annotate? How do we get from a bin name to an annotation name? That is the money question. And I'm gonna go through some screenshots of some software on how you can do that yourself and also explain how we do it on our side so you have a better understanding of how it's done. So you need a software for that. So we have some several semi-automated semi NMR software. So I say semi-automated because the software does most of it for you but it requires some manual intervention from the, the user. So you need some NMR understanding and you need to know what you're doing with NMR Spectra. Bruca has several programs, but you need to pay for a license to use them. Economics is a free program, but you can upgrade it to a premium program, um, which most things in life now you, you get free, but then you've got to upgrade to get the, the, the program that you really want. The middle one there is called Batman, which I think is an awesome name for a program that uses R script. And the bottom there is Metabo Minor, which is used for two-dimensional NMR annotations. So these are just some examples. There's plenty others, but 
I'm going to recommend that we start with Kinomics because it's free and it's very user friendly. So this is Kinomics. I've opened it up in my program and in the background there I opened up an example of one of the samples we analyzed of the 300. So all you need is the raw NMR spectral file and you can open it up in this free program and you can explore the entire spectrum. So I've zoomed into in this specific region here. This region is between 0 0.8 and 1.1. This is my area of interest for this talk. And at the bottom there, you can see there's a table. This table consists of 338 compounds. That's the database basically of economics. It's constantly increasing as they improve upon the versions. But for now, this version has 338 possible metabolites that you can identify. And the top right there, you can see I've put five bin names. And the annotations there is isoleucine, valine, and isoleucine again. So we're going to work through this particular part of the spectrum using this program to see how do we annotate these compounds. So I zoom a little bit closer into this region between 0 0.9 and 0 0.95. And the first bin I'm going to look at is 0 0.93. So I right click in that region, and this window pops up. And you can see there it says search for compounds near 0 0.93. And you click on that and it brings up this table at the bottom there. And this table has 14 compounds. So that's 14 possible matches in this region of 0 0.93. So this is where the, the user intervention comes into, into play. You need to work through this list one by one to find the best match occurring here. So I work through it step by step. I'm not going to go through each of them, but we come to isoleucine, and it, for me it's a nice fit, but why, why, why do I say it's a nice fit? Well, if you look at it, you add some lines to it, those three peaks there that part of the triplet, they match peaks that are present in the actual raw spectrum, raw spectrum in the background there. And for, more importantly for me, they're equal distance apart. So this is um, more advanced NMR, and you, know, you always want to leave the audience wanting more, so and maybe in the future we can do a more advanced NMR webinar um, on the 2D stuff and on how to look at the distances and the J couplings. But for now, for me, this is important. So that triplet fits nicely. On the left-hand side there, that duplet also fits nicely with the spectrum in the background. So for me, this is a nice fit. And I would say this is a good annotation for us. I say annotation, it's not a metabolite identity yet. Uh, we're going to work through the entire spectrum at the end of it, we didn't have to look at two-dimensional data to confirm identities. And only then, once the two-dimensional information confirms the identities, can we say these are metabolite identities. So just working through the table, 0 0.93, 0 0.94, and 1.01, .01, they're all part of isoleucine. And that's great. So that's three of the five bins. And in the top left of the, the economics, window there, you can see there are six positions open, 0 0.9, 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.52, and 3.7. And if you recall, again, back to that slide I spent a little bit of time on, you can have multiple positions, multiple peaks for one metabolite. So you should always go through the entire spectrum to see if you can identify those peaks there. Sometimes in the case of isoleucine, if it's low in concentration, it's very difficult to identify the other peaks because they could be overlaid with um, higher concentration metabolites. That's not always possible. That's where the two-dimensional information helps because it over, overshadows that, 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 that problem of overlapping. So we have two other bins we're going to look at as well, 0 0.98 and 1.00. So moving forward, we go to 0 0.98. Do the same concept, we right click over there. We see search for compound for 0 0.98. Left click on that, we get a table at the bottom. And now we have 10 compounds that can fit in this region. Work through all of this. And at the bottom of the list, we find valine. There's two duplets there, they fit very nicely. And there are two other positions in this spectrum as well, 2.3 and 3.6. I, I did go look, look through, around through the, the spectrum and because this is of a higher concentration, they were present. I don't show them here, I just want to stick to this certain region over here. I don't want to complicate things. And these two annotations I'm quite comfortable with. And this is how we, we work through it step by step using the semi-automated program, going 
bit by bit for each bin. And you can see it can be time consuming, requires some human intervention. And that is a bottleneck at the program. But at, at the moment in metabolomics, especially in MR metabolomics, um, in this method, it, you could be highly specific in what you're selecting, but it is laborious and time-wise. And this is why we cannot profile from the beginning doing each sample individually. If you have to profile from the beginning to the end, it'll take about five, six hours to do one, sample, one matrix or one spectrum, I should say, one spectrum. And if you have 300 spectrums and you want to profile each one individually, that's going to take you a very long time for one project. So we, we rely upon statistics to identify a small amount of bins that we can then focus upon. So I showed you the annotation part there, and I like to switch to a second program called MX Viewer. Now it's always good to use two programs to annotate to um, have greater confidence confidence in what you're identifying. And this one, this is a Bruker program, and there's two reasons why I like to use Bruker MX. Is a you, you confirm the identities using the libraries, yeah. So the table that I have here at the bottom is a commercial library. I can use that library that Bruker created, the so BioRef code library. And all the other libraries there that are present, lipid class, detox, liver, vitamin, oligosaccharides, all those are from previous projects. So I can use those as well to help confirm identities or annotations. And I prefer using Amex Viewer for integration, for quantifying, because it's more accurate than um, economics in my opinion. So we're going to open up the two pure compounds that we annotated, the isoleucine and the leucine, or isoleucine and valine. They are in the middle there, the isoleucine is in green, the, tripl the triplet and the duplet, and the valine is red, the duplet and the duplet. And the bottom there, you can see, I opened up all the other samples that we analyzed in this experiment, and you can see it's rather chaotic. So how do we, add, how do we quantify? Well, the, the simplest way to do it is, identify regions that are isolated and not interfered by other peaks. So the triplet of isoleucine, if you look on the right there, at the bottom, there are some several other peaks that are interfering. So I wanted to use that triplet to quantify isoleucine. On the left there, that, that, that duplet there, if you look down at the bottom there, there are very two clear peaks, that are not interfered by any other peaks. I would then use that for the quantification. So we calculate the integral of each of those peaks, combine them together, and that will that would represent the CH3 of isoleucine. We do the same for valine. On the left-hand side there, you can see there's a very large triplet that's overlapping, and that would affect the quantification. So we went and used the left, left duplet there. So the right duplet of valine over there, you look at the bottom, there's nothing else really interfering over there, and we would calculate the integral of those peaks, combine combine them together and that would form the CH component of valine. And we'll do this step by step across all the, the annotated compounds. And we will create a table of integral values and we'll export this to Excel. And in Excel, we can then use a formula because we know how much internal standard we're adding to the sample, it's constant. We can then calculate the absolute quantification or absolute, con your absolute concentration. In this case, micromolar. So you'll create a table now with the metabolite identities. So after all of this, you've just been had spectral data annotations. Now we come to the final table of metabolite identities and concentrations. This is what metabolite profiling wants to produce in the end. But this is a giant table again of lots of numbers. You don't want lots of numbers just bam smack on a publication. You want a nice image. So you ask your stats person, can you please put this into a nice image? And Marie did that for us. And you can see these are in box plots. So you can either do medians or median, medians or means in the middle there. You can do your outliers and you can do your p-value to see what is the significant difference on a unit variant level of the concentration values. So now we have the concentration values. We completed our metabolite profiling. So you can see it's a bit of a process from beginning to end. But if you do it right, you get good quality outputs. And that's what you need for publication purposes. So everything I've discussed so far has been on semi-automated programs. We are moving towards fully automated programs. Uh, David Wishart's Canadian group there, um, and plus one, they published a paper uh, on Basil that uploaded a program online. 
Um, it's meant for serum and cerebral spinal fluids only. It has a limited database at the moment. And we have two postgrad students here at NWU. They are going to be testing it this year. Um, one on serum and one on urine. We're going to see how the results look on that. We're using external quality control samples of spiked known metabolites. So we'll be able to calculate accurate accuracy, the precision, all that wonderful stuff. And just recently in April 2020, a program was released called Sigma by a Danish group, Signature Mapping. Uh, this is the version one, a beta version. So it's just been released and we want to test this as soon as possible as well to see how it is working. So you can see we're moving more towards fully automated programs to try and overcome that bottleneck that I've discussed on all these slides previously. So let's go to the summary of our webinar. So what have we covered in this untargeted NMR metabolomics? So the background, I covered metabolomics is multidisciplinary and metabolites, they produce unique 1H NMR spectrums patterns. So that's the background information I'm hoping that everyone takes from this. Untargeted to NMR, I showed you binning and what it is. It creates a spectral data matrix that you give to your stats experts to do magic. You need that magic component. <laughs> and that will produce a table of important bins. You use those bins for metabolite profiling. So you use your understanding of 1H NMR, the 101 1H NMR, use semi-automated programs, you then annotate and quantify. And you combine all of this together and then you can publish your results. And if you do all this correctly, you have high quality output, you have a high quality publication. So that is my story, short and sweet, half an hour. And I'm gonna end on a positive note. Think like a proton, always positive. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Mason. Uh, I enjoyed that. I hope <laughs> everyone else did. <laughs> um, we did get a question about software, uh, but I think it was before your slide about the software, so I think that was addressed. And okay. we'll ad address it in the chat as well. Um, so what I would like to do now is, if you feel you have a question, you can just unmute your mic and we can have a discussion. Sure, let's go for it. Yeah. Hello, Doctor, good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, um, thank you very much. This is uh, Chinedu Anoko. Um, I want to ask something concerning the, the software. Uh, yes. I, the the, the um, uh, Kinomics actually caught my attention because it's free. Uh, but um, I think I was a bit disappointed when you said Bruca is more reliable or is, is, is better off. So can one publish any, doc, any, any paper using just the Kinomics? You could, you could, you, you can stop at just the annotation part and identify what is important um, without quantifying. So you just create a list of what metabolites are important and you just stop there and you do an interpretation of that. But you, you would like to go all the way to the end and quantify and compare yeah. them, the controls and the experimental groups and the reference ranges, but you can just stop there and talk about what is important. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. That's relieving. Great. Uh, anyone else? Just feel free to unmute your mic and, and if you have a question. Don't be scared. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Shay. Joy. Can How you hear you? me? Yes, Joy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My question I posed to Molati privately by the chat, but I can see he's not reading that. Anyway, I'm going to just ask you directly. Sure. I want to know if it's, it's possible to use a reference standard in NMR, especially for targeted analysis, instead of doing those annotations using library. Uh, standards? Yeah, like, let's say I'm doing a targeted uh, analysis where I know I'm looking for glucose or looking for any compound that of interest that I know. Uh, can I use a reference standard? You know, well, uh, standard first and then compare the, 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 the spectrum. Of if you recall that the, the slide I opened with 
with the Amex, we have a library there of various different um, projects that, that we actually did um, take standards and we created a pure compound spectra of that. So if you have something unusual that's not in our database, you can always add it to our database. So if in the case of glucose, that's quite common and we've already done that. We have already have it in our database. So everything in the database is of a standard, a pure compound standard. But if you find something weird and if you're analyzing something weird, you can always add it to the list and use that to identify. In so your, sort, of, your... sort of creating a library. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So that's also the great thing is you don't need isotopic standards um, as you do with LCMS. So you don't need yeah. high purity things. You just need something of greater than 95% purity and that's more than enough for NMR. Thanks, Sure. Uh, there's, a quite, there's a few questions in the chat box. Uh, I would like to know which program I can use to process the PCA. The PCA, yes, the question of stats. That's a big question. So I think that will be for another webinar for a stats expert, uh, expert to advise on. Um, I don't know who will, will give that webinar. So there are several in the, in the series that we can do. Um, PCA wise, I said the best one at the moment, the easiest one is Metaba Analyst because that's online and it's also free and it's constantly updated. But uh, I'll leave it for a stats expert to advise. Okay. Um, so, sorry, Maladi. Um, okay, go ahead. Question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yes, it's, it's Gabriel from uh, Stellenbosch University. Firstly, I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Mason for the great talk. My, my question is more um, of a practical question than a technical one. Um, we, we do work with uh, TB cell extract. Hmm. And so in, in most cases, you have small amounts to, of, of material or samples to analyze. Hmm. And so even though we, we, we are interested in NMR, NMR, we just want to, to ask the question of practic I mean, how practical it is that we can get samples you know, of microliters to be able to analyze on the, on, on the NMR. And how accurate will that be? Well, we have recently um, developed a miniaturized method. Um, another master student of ours, she was examining um, mouse tissue samples specifically mouse uh, muscle tissues. And that's a limited quantity sample. So some of the samples, um, you had enough, um, say about 80 milligrams of sample to analyze, whereas other cases you only have four milligrams. So we developed this miniaturized method that only uses 100 microliters of volume. So it's perfect for those sort of cases where you have cultures or limited quantity volumes. So th there is a publication that we've done on that. So you can Google that um, miniaturized NMR metabolomics um, from our group. And it worked quite well. Um, for the 80 milligram um, muscle tissue, it worked quite well. You can actually concentrate it to 800 milligrams and you actually see a lot more than, you want, than what you would normally see. But there is a limitation with NMR. It's not as sensitive as other machines, the MS space machine. So four milligrams was not enough to produce results. So you, you have to be aware that there are certain limitations with NMR, but we can definitely do limited quantity, limited volume analysis down to amount of 100 microliters and I'll say 60 to 80 milli, uh, milligrams of culture or tissue sample would be great to use. You just do an extraction method of that and we'll analyze that. All right, thank you very much. Sure. I'll have a look at it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, there's another question in here. Um, what are some of the stage gates, i.e. quality matrix to look out for uh, to ensure good outputs? What, sorry, say that again? Uh, what are some of the stage gates uh, with regards to quality matrix to look out for to ensure good outputs? Stage gates. Uh, Dr. Becker, maybe speak on the question to clarify. 
Hi, Shane John here. Hi, John. Um, so for other omics, we know when we have sort of bad reads or for genotyping, when we have low call rates and all of these things, do you look at peak heights or peak overlaps or when, when would you decide that I'd rather start over with the program than try and squeeze out okay. the little information that I can? Is that better articulated? Sorry. Yes, yes, that's better. Uh, okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, so, so as an NMI analyst, I would then first of all look at the qualitative raw data just to check to see if the machine's running okay. Um, if anything pops up like the water suppression or the, 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 the peaks are just too broad, I would start the experiment again because the machine's not calibrated properly. So just from NMI analyst, I'll do a quick check on that. And then once we get the actual data, once I'm comfortable that it looks okay, we'll do quantitatively from the stats side. So we'll look at the CV values. Um, usually about 50% is the CV value that we work on in metabolomics. Every, anything above that, we would then throw away as unreliable. Um, so anything on the noise region would basically produce CVs quite high. And I think that's one of the major filtering steps that we do with the CVs. For the MS side, we, we, we do go more in depth with that. So we're trying to do batch um, corrections. So if you have six batches, uh, if there's a drift from batch one to batch six, we might try and adjust for that. But we don't see that in, in, in NMR because the sample doesn't come in contact with the machine. It stays in the NMR tube. It gets calibrated per sample. So it's a very repeatable, very reliable method. So while it has many downfalls, it has many advantages, but it works hand in hand with the MS side. So I hope that answers that question there. Great. Um, I see Regan has his hand up. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> How are you doing? Hi, Regan. <laughs> so, Tying in, so, so I'm Regan Solomon from Stellenbosch University. Um, so tying in with Gabriel's question, so you told us about your miniaturized um, sort of sampling or, or protocol using 100 microliters. From a clinician's point of view, clinician researcher working with you, how would you um, like your samples to be prepped? And what is the duration from sampling to uh, NMR sampling um, and I'm thinking about biological fluids and degradation. So how would you like to get the samples? What is the best state? Some advice for me. Well, ideally we want them frozen as soon as possible um, to stop any sort of um, enzyme reactions, any sort of metabolomic changes. Uh, uh, but that's often not logistically feasible in hospitals, um, a nurse collects it and the patient it has to be stabilized. So there's a lot of um, other aspects to take in consideration. So the sooner you can freeze the sample, the sooner you can stop the sample from changing and you keep it frozen and then have it transported frozen as well. So ideally you just want to basically stop anything happening in the sample at that point in time. Um, in the case of um, yeah, culture samples, tissue samples such as that, you might want to quench the sample to kind of stop any bacterial activity. So if you're doing any bacterial cultures, you want to stop the actual bacterial activity as well. So basically you just want to stop any activity that's occurring in the sample. So you can be able to analyze that patient sample without having any artifacts occurring in there. Thank you. Ben. All right. Uh, next question is if there's no other hand, uh, can this methodology be extrapolated to use in natural product extracts? It probably could. It probably could. <laughs> um, our focus is on human metabolomics, so we don't have as much experience on the natural um, product side. Um, our databases are geared towards mammalian samples. So you have to have a, a database to work with. So if you can supply the pure compounds of what you want to do, so more of a targeted approach, we can add those pure compounds to the library and see if we can find what you want to look for. 
but otherwise it is difficult for us to do it. If you, if you want to do untargeted, you'll need to find a lab that is focused more on natural products, but we can certainly do it if you supply the pure compounds. Sounds good. Um, I guess maybe this is your question and everyone else in the, in the webinar. Um, where are the centers with NMR facilities and how would one go about exploring potential projects? Uh, as far as I know, at NWU, we're the, we're the only one that does biofluid analysis for um, human metabolomics, mammalian sort of thing. Um, UJ and UNISA, they have um, plant metabolomics there, they have NMR for that. So people sometimes come to us for plant-based projects, but we don't have a database for that. We don't have the expertise here. So we would then um, ask them just to you know, contact someone like Fidel at UJ or at UNISA, because um, they have a better understanding of the plant side. There are plenty of NMRs in the country, um, but they're all pretty much chemistry based. So they are dedicated towards analyzing one compound at a time. And you know, with, with our metabolomics analysis, we're looking at many compounds at the same time and they don't know what to do with that sample. So we, we are limited in NMR labs at the moment in South Africa, but we're not limited in expertise. We are growing in expertise, so that's great. And yeah, uh, uh, UJ is, is one to look out for as well. And I know Dr. Sutoli as well does lots of HIV um, analysis there on samples. So yeah, there the are expanding. also apparently, um, and UKZN does have some. But if if you if you want maybe contacts in in these institutions to to help you with that, we can we can give you a few emails of people to contact. Mm. Um, what is the next one? There was a general question about um, the events, I guess we've had, You've, you, you mentioned the introductory workshop that we had last year. Um, there was a, someone who asked because they're saying they're in the early stages of their, their NMR research. And I was saying the best we can do for now is, is these sort of webinars and maybe emails and, 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 and virtual meetings, but we don't have anything concrete this year because of what is obviously going on. But we you know, this, this year is very complicated. Yeah, very. But just just keep in touch with with myself or Dr. Mason, and then we'll see what we can do to assist. Um, there was a question about freezing extracts. Can extracts be frozen before analysis? And if so, uh, how long? Yeah, you can, they, 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 they are, they are. <laughs> uh, tissue samples, anything like that, you can do sample preparation, extractions of normal blood dye extractions, and you can freeze them and it, it can be, remain stable for quite some time. There are different studies that in the literature that show how long they can last. Um, so obviously you want to do it as soon as possible, but certainly yes, if you do the extraction in your lab, so that, that's what I would recommend is you take the sample, in your lab, so if you're in Cape Town, do the extraction there, freeze it, dry it, freeze it, and then send that frozen sample to the NMR lab to do analysis, because you want to stop the sample as soon as possible, quench it, do all the preparation there, and the extracted sample can be stable as long as it's kept frozen for the, dur the duration of the transport to the lab. How long it remains stable? It's it's the question that many people try and answer in publications. So you'll have to look through that. So that I cannot answer. But certainly, yeah, you can you can freeze an abstract, uh, extract and send it to us or any um, NMR lab to do analysis on that. That's great. Uh, yeah, I don't think there are any more questions on the on the chat unless I missed some. Uh, anyone else have a, a question? They are sitting on. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mason, for today's webinar. Thank um, you. It was very useful, and I'm 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 glad it was 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 a brilliant one to start us off with. <laughs> uh, we will be having more of these. We'll try and get one in once a month, depending on 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 availability. 
so that we don't take up too much of your time, but also to, to maintain the momentum. Um, I did not thank Northwest University, who have been a great partner to MSA and to ACGT uh, with regards to, to everything in metabolomics. You guys have been um, very solid with, with, with your help and your assistance. Um, I would also like to thank my team at the ACGT for helping me out with all of the arrangements. Um, and the MSA team as well, specifically uh, Ms. Kekeleto, who's been doing our, our communications manager, managing the social media sites and the website. Uh, we are trying to, 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 to be as visible as possible, uh, but we would urge some of the students who want to be involved, please contact me. We're looking for people with special skills or if you, if you feel you can contribute. It's as simple as sharing the latest paper that you thought was interesting in metabolomics and just putting it on the website or the, on our Twitter account. But we're just trying to get this momentum going. Um, like I said, we are approaching 200 members already. And judging by the attendance in this, in this um, webinar already, I think there's a lot of people that share common ground and I think we can, we can get some cool things done this year. Um, thank you for the audience for actually showing up. Uh, when you're preparing for these things, you, <laughs> you, you get hit with people sign up, but they really don't show up. So you, you hope that they, they, they register and show up, but you guys definitely did and participated. Thank you. Um, I will be in touch about the next one. And anyone in the audience who feels they have something that they would like to contribute, please email me and then we can schedule one. And you can share a technique, your research, something that you think everyone else should be should be aware of. But yeah, again, thank you. I don't know if anyone from the MSA committee would like to say something uh, before we log off. Well, thank you to Malati as well. Mm. Ah, me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, have a great day, so, guys. Uh, for, for all of this is... Did you want to say something, Fido? No, it was just to say thank you for uh, organizing this and thank you to Shane. Uh, it's really great talk. And uh, thank you for the, uh, those who attended. And uh, as Morati said, to, we have more of this. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Morati and Shane. I appreciate it. Cheers. It's a pleasure. All right, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Uh, Bye bye. Bye. Bye.